Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Hi, everyone. It's Roxanne Durhodge. Thanks for tuning in with Authentic Living with Roxanne this week. Uh, today, I have a special, uh, I would say, soon-to-be friend because I've just met her, Pat, Patty Honroth. She um, is a leadership and success coach, and we were uh, recently introduced by a very dear friend, uh, Penny Tremblay. Um, and as for uh, other people that have listened to the podcast, she uh, does conflict resolution, playing nice in the sandbox. And um, she was the, you know, thought that uh, Patty and I were in some synergy. And I was, I've been invited. Uh, Patty's doing a summit, uh, which I'd love for all of you to um, look at the show notes because there'll be a link to the summit. And that's on April 26th to May 7th, where you can listen to myself. Um, and lots of uh, experts um, in leadership. So Patty, thanks so much for coming in today uh, to be on the pod- podcast. Roxanne, I'm truly honored to be here with you and I'm just am looking forward to spending a bit of time sharing with your audience today. Awesome, so let's, I mean, obviously you're, you're doing, um, you've been in this field for a long time and I, I know your your story is quite fascinating, and I, I love you know when when you told me offline. Uh, but just kind of tell us about your path and kind of what you what makes you inspires you today to do what you do and to obviously uh, you know accomplish a bigger goal like uh, running a summit. Sure, I'm happy to. I'll just do a little bit of a, a backstory just very quickly. I spent over 20 years um, in the banking industry, managing customer service in uh, in Ontario. And uh, married my current husband, Joe, 19 years ago, which um, I had concluded my, my, my time with the bank when I married Joe and moved to Northern Ontario. And at that point in time, Joe ran his own, per, uh, his own construction company, building homes and cottages, et cetera. So I kind of took on the role of administration and cus- dealing with customers and stuff like that. But I'll be honest, construction was not my passion. And and when we became empty nesters, I knew it was time for me to really look into, okay, you know, I'm in my 50s now. And what do I want to do with the rest of my life? You know, kind of like, what do I want to be when I really grow up, right? And uh, so I went on a journey of discovery and finally ended up um, deciding that building my own coaching practice was really what I was passionate about. And I became a certified coach in August of 2012, um, which I was absolutely loving. And then in August 2015, my life took a huge change in trajectory along with Joe, um, when he was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's at the age of 53. So that obviously was a was a shock. And I'll be honest, though, like, as I like to say, once I kind of picked myself up off the floor, um, as being a coach, I decided very quickly, I knew the power of goals and I decided very quickly to set myself two goals. And my number one goal was to always ensure that Joe had the best care possible, knowing that would not always be me. And number two was my goal was to not go down with the ship and certainly no disrespect to my husband, but I knew the rate of caregiver burnout and or early death was extremely high. So those were kind of the two goals that I set that really became my anchors to go through this journey. Um, I'd never really been around anybody with Alzheimer's. I knew, you know, basic information, but I really didn't know what the journey was going to look like. And I just wanted to do the best that I possibly could to thrive through this and not just survive. Um, And I'll be honest, I've learned that thrive has a different meaning for everybody. And, you know, so that kind of set me on my journey. And it's, you know, it's obviously been a very tumultuous one. Joe's been in long term care now for a year and a half. And when the pandemic hit, um, you know, I 
everything went into lockdown and I went 374 days without being able to get in to see Joe. So thankfully I just got in to see him about four weeks ago and I'm just truly blessed to be able to get in and sit there uh, with him. Obviously there's been a lot of change and we had a lot of FaceTime throughout that time. I was FaceTiming regularly throughout the week um, and some window visits, but it's, it's just not the same as sitting there and holding his hand and just being present with him. So, so let's let's talk about okay you're 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 young and you're you're dealing with this situation and you know I think developmentally what you know most of us will accept that as we get older things will happen um, and maybe it's not going to be you know that sudden where all of a sudden you're having to deal with a with an issue like well like Alzheimer's what what happened for you. When you realized, like you said, oh, oh, you know, I'm goal driven and I'm I'm going to f- figure this out. But I'm going to say that prior to that, there must have been a gap where you must have been going through a lot of things in, in, in grieving what was and what was to be. Well, that's a, that's an interesting thought, Roxanne. I'll be honest, the grieving didn't start for me right away. Um, I kind of because I'm a get things done kind of person, I just kind of went into the mold of what are the steps that I'm going to need to look at? The, I'll, I'll absolutely speak into the grieving because it came just a little bit later. Um, for me, um, I went into the mode of what are the steps that I'm going to have to potentially look at walking through? And, you know, to be honest, what it, what it came to, Joe being a builder had you know, he'd build us a beautiful home on 14 acres in the country. And, you know, this was our dream home. This was our dream. And we had so many dreams that we were, you know, looking forward to doing together. We wanted to do some work in third world countries and, you know, stuff like that. So honestly, one of the first processes that I had to walk through, or I chose to walk through, I didn't have to, all of this is choices, obviously, but what I chose to walk through was honestly starting to let go of the dreams that Joe and I had together and starting to reformulate. um, And this didn't happen like immediately. This was a little bit into the journey. Um, But that was one of the big processes that I went through in the beginning was just working through that, you know, all those dreams that we had as a couple together we're not going to come to fruition. And I had to work on coming to that reality. So that in essence is a grieving process because absolutely, absolutely. It is. It's maybe the, maybe the term, you know, like, because generally we think grief as, you know, loss in the traditional sense, but uh, you know, from a, from an emotional lens to some degree, you had, you were grieving because now here's this, all these dreams and goals and, and this beautiful home and, and maybe the things you were going to do and you were going to go to, you know, like you said, different third world countries. And now that door is, is you know, kind of shutting right between your, before your eyes. Yes. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's- exactly. So it, it, it definitely was a grieving process. Just, you know, as you say, it's a little different than the, maybe the traditional sense, because there was, there was all this loss that, you know, I was, I was experiencing and going through um, of what was not going to be anymore. You know, you spend your whole life quite often, you know, thinking about, and and it wasn't even retirement for us. It was just what we want, how we wanted to live our life in, in later years when our, when our kids were out on their own and, and doing their own thing. And it was just the two of us. And, um, and that was no longer a possibility. So there absolutely was a grieving process in that. And there's been many different grieving. It's been, an, it's an ongoing grieving process, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, as I, as I quite often say to people, the way I, just because I work in pictures best, if I were to look at Joe as a, as a puzzle, I'm watching a piece of the puzzle fall away, you know, bit by bit as as we're walking this journey and so it's so it is an ongoing grieving process and as you well know in you know your field and what you do grief just shows up it just shows up unexpectedly it's not like okay today I'm free and I can grieve today you know I could be in the middle of getting ready to do a podcast (laughs) with somebody like you and grief shows up um 
I also say that it doesn't have any time. It doesn't yeah. have any channel. And I've, I've also gone through a significant loss. I lost my uh, youngest sister. It's going to be five years ago. And mm. um, yeah, and then it's all of a sudden it's, it's, you know, like a thought within a thought based on a picture or a so- song yeah. or something. And then before you know, you're flooded up and you're like, you know, you're in your car and thinking, wow, where did this just come from? You yeah. know, so I, th- I don't think there's ever, you know, a beginning, middle and end, especially when you're dealing with something kind of chronic. If it's acute, that's a different kind of situation. But when it's it's kind of you're looking at a Joe right before your eyes and then mm-hmm. potentially you're saying, wow, that capacity just got shifted. That yeah, experience yeah. I'll never have again. That it, that maybe that that conversation may not never happen again. So that's you know, so microscopic, um, which a lot of, you know, caregivers uh, talk about, it's almost like they're grieving, but there's the person still alive. Yes. And, um, you know, and then they go through the process. So by the time um, some individuals and I had, uh, I think Deborah Bakhti, I mentioned to you um, she, at the end, she said, you know, there was so much grieving while uh, her husband was alive, but at the time she had passed, she had done a lot of grieving. It was a different kind of grief at the end. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, just on this vein, and then, you know, I'll switch into some of the things that I've been doing to really help me personally mm-hmm. walk through this and get to the point of taking the big leap of, uh, of putting on this summit. But it's, I've, I've noticed since I've been able to get back in to see Joe, um, obviously a big change in him, but just so relishing in the little things that I still can share with him, whether it's a, a little smile or, you know, he chuckles at something and, you know, he gets the odd word out that still makes sense. And just, you know, things that I never thought of in my life before that I would be so grateful for and just relish like you might a beautiful sunset that you just can't explain. Um, you know, those are, those are the things that I'm really grateful for and noticing now that I may have missed before um, walking this journey. Which, and I think in this time, most of us have been experiencing that, you know, but you've probably got it at a, even even a deeper, like 374 days, which there's been progression. Obviously there's been shifts within you, but also with him, um, his disease has progressed as well. And, but I know like with all of us within the pandemic, you know, the things that we are now connecting with compared to, at least I can speak to myself, I can't say for everyone, sure, but even sure. from the experiences I've heard people talk about, like, um, you know, I'm back onto the woods where I am and mm-hmm. quite literally the birds that I see, or even when I go for my walks, the things that I notice now that I, I've i done that, I've lived in this home for like 25 years, I mm-hmm. really had the depth of experience before. Um, so I think... I'm sure most people listening can relate uh, to some degree. Um, That's some of the benefits of coming out of this is, you know, our presence and our awareness for, for a lot of people has really been heightened. And that's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Out of adversity, you know, what, what are the positives that are coming? So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about you and um, your role. Like you said, you kind of thought, what am I going to do when I grow up? Um, but how did you, I'm going to assume you brought some of that with you into what you did into your practice, um, of coaching. And now we were, you know, you get to the point where you're doing this, this big initiative of, of, uh, of a summit. So tell us kind of what parts of that you brought to the coaching or how you kind of looked at things maybe differently or maybe not differently. Maybe you focused a bit more. What, yeah. what has been your experience? Well, my, my experience has been, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for the, I guess the year and a half I had in my coaching practice prior to Joe becoming ill, because I was, you know, I was very focused on learning and implementing and, and, you know, really helping my clients create transformations in their life. Um, so, you know, because I'd taken in and, and done as much learning as I had, up until that point. And I believe I was really a coach by heart, even in back in my banking days, when I was leading teams with customer service, I'm, you know, in hindsight, now I coached a lot of people and didn't put the term coaching on it, because it, that's, 
we didn't know that much about, or I didn't know that much about coaching back then and to be able to quote unquote, put a label on it. But, you know, my coaching background has really enabled me to, you know, kind of self coach myself sometimes throughout this. And I think, you know, as, as people listening to, to your podcast, I think that's something that we maybe don't put enough emphasis on about how much we really can, you know, dig into things ourselves and, and not always rely on external sources. Those external sources are critical and a big part, but, you know, just the amount that we can really do for ourselves as well. When we learn some of the tools, one of the things that I noticed very quickly in the the journey with Joe was that the people that I would say were in our inner circle and part of our support system coming into that I was very quickly realizing well not very quickly but you know over the course of a year or 18 months starting to realize that they weren't necessarily going to be the same people that were going to travel the journey with us as our inner circle so I'm big on teaching about the power of your inner circle and very intentionally selecting those people um, and giving yourself a criteria, like what are your needs that need to be met? What are your values? What are you, what do you want to be in alignment with? And this was, you know, when I was looking at selecting my inner circle, I wasn't looking at it as a one way street that they were just going to pour into me. I was looking for a very small intimate group of women that we were going to, that we shared values, we shared dreams, we shared purpose, we shared, you know, all the things that were important to us in life, we were, you know, kind of in the same wavelength, so that we could be a support system for each other, we could right. lift each other up, we could be there and be super compassionate when somebody was really having a difficult time. And I don't mean to say this in, in, in the past, because it's, it's still going on. Um, it's just grown to be such an integral part of my life. You know, there's probably four women that I would say that I've developed these relationships with. And I honestly, with the four of them, I, I literally could call them at any time of the night or day and just know that that support system is there and they could do the same thing with me. So developing that inner circle has been integral but again you know I just want to reiterate the importance of you know making sure that these people are in alignment with you where you're going your dreams your values your needs those core essences of who you are and what really matters to you and I would think Patty that um, and I know what you know with myself with my life uh, making major changes that prior to going through anything difficult I was the one that was there on a deeper level based on what I did and I think, you know, what was helpful, I think my friends were waiting to see what I was going to do because I was always the one to extend and be available, but I'd not really been through anything significant. And uh, like with myself, I went through a lot of change uh, 10 years ago and then wrote my book and start, you know, but my, my book was based on my endings. So it's interesting you're talking about endings. And I think what has started to happen for me is that people in my life start to say, okay, let's see what she's going to do. And I was, you know, overwhelmed because then I said, I need, I need, I need. And they were like, okay, well, it's about time, you know, mm -hmm. because we've been here and you've been supportive and you've been kind and you've been gentle and you've been authentic. And, you know, what can we do? And it's interesting. And people that I thought would have been there when I reached out that I think had a perception of me of being a certain way they couldn't uh, deal with my vulnerability and my need at that point. So to your point, I, th I, th I think that's so valuable mm -hmm. um, having lived it as well is to really that values alignment um, is so key. And sometimes I say the universe says, okay, you know, reason season a lifetime. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and that's what started to happen. Then the core people that were there for me when I was having the toughest time is still the core coordinate people that exist in my life today. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that was, um, you know, and, and I just want to point out no disrespect to the people that were in my life before. Mm -hmm. They're still in my life, but they're in my life in a different way, right? Um, and they'll always be a part of my life. Some of them are very dear friends, but I, they weren't the people that I knew were going to be that inner circle support system. But 
you know, everybody's on their own journey and everybody's trying to figure life out and everybody's got their own stuff going on. And, Absolutely. you know, right. And that's, that's part of, you know, to flip into momentarily about what kind of really has, has spurred me on to do this summit. You know, it's the summit is called professional women rising and it's a masterclass series to go from, I know there's more to life to living fully and boldly. And that in essence is based on my journey. Like, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, I didn't want to just survive this to me. Survival is, is the, is the, I hate to use this term, but I don't know what else to use the lowest level of just above not surviving. <laughs> <laughs> just above the line. And, and that, that yeah, line. exactly. You wanted to thrive in it. And I think, you know, it's, it's so interesting and I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm going to be fascinating to listen to all the other speakers and I'm going to also share my story, but yeah, when you're, you know, at first you're like, okay, well, I'm getting up, I'm getting dressed, I'm doing all these things. And then you start to realize as you wade through things that are uh, very painful at times, that there's another side. I often say, um, you can get the guidance, like you said. And I often, my, and I would say to people, and you know, and even my coaching or speaking, some, but sometimes you have to go through that tunnel that's awfully dark by yourself, knowing that there's going to be light on the other end. So you can't take everybody with you all the time. You yeah. need that, that support. But at some point, you got to walk on your yeah. own. Absolutely. And, and with myself, I can say that I'm. It was the best thing that happened to me, even though it was uh, at the time, it was quite difficult on me. But now I look at, you know, 10 years later and the kind of life that I've created for myself and um, the things that I've done. And, you know, I, I'm just so grateful, you know, day in, day out for everything that has happened, even mm -hmm. though it meant a massive ending. Yeah. Um, there were valuable lessons that um, through that tunnel. You know, Absolutely. I and I so agree. I've, I've got a little sign right beside my, my laptop here that says Joe is my reason and not my excuse. And I think so many people, and, and again, not to, not to minimize what anybody is going through. Um, you know, there's varying degrees of what we're all going through and whether it, what, whatever it is you're going through, it's real for you and it's your journey. And I honor that. And I respect that. You know, but what what happened with me was, you know, after Joe had been, you know, after he had moved into long term care, I spent that was in August of 2019. So I spent kind of that fall and winter kind of really working on me going through the tunnel, rebuilding some dreams, like starting to dream again. Like, what do I want my life to look like? What do I want to do moving forward? And I was I felt like I was just really getting a handle on that when the pandemic hit. Jesus. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that was, that was another whole situation. I believe in being very transparent with my audiences, you know, that kind of really, that really set me back for two or three months. Like I, <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know how I thought I'd been through the worst of the worst or was going through the worst of the worst when the pandemic hit. Um, but, you know, again, reality, uh, sooner or later, we have to face it and, and choose. This is a big part of what I work on with my clients is, you know, we have way more choices in life than what we quite often think we do. So I still had the choice of, you know, facing the reality of the situation we were in, we were all globally in, but how was I as a person going to maneuver this? And you talked earlier about, you know, people, when, when, when you, first got vulnerable and whatever people watching you and that I, it's interesting because I had that same revelation at the beginning of the journey with Joe that my kids are going to be watching my grandkids are going to be watching my friends are going to be watching people are going to watch how I choose to navigate this and you know certainly not to put myself on a pedestal but I can be the I can be a person that they can look to as to how to authentically maneuver through traumatic times like that or difficult times like that. Um, the ups and the downs, because that's the reality of life. We're all experiencing the ups and the downs, but, you know, choosing to get back up again and dust yourself off and keep going. That's the point that I got to, you know, three or four months in, into the pandemic was okay. <laughs> Here I am again. Now right? that I'm cutting back up and I'm dusting myself a little off. But I think 
you know, what I love about what you're saying is that oftentimes we see the person on when they've already risen already. We don't see that the, you know, the messy steps and most people potentially, I can't say everybody aren't willing to share how tough some of those times were in between. And because I would say, you know, the average one that I would, they would say to me, hey, Roxanne, I see you on a stage. I see you, you know, doing all these things, but what's the backstory? Like yeah. you went through all this tough time and then you, you know, get, you know, got a severance package. You got assaulted by a, fit, a complete stranger on the street. You went through all that. You had a corporate career. Then your marriage ended. Then you wrote a book. Okay, well, could get back up. Let's rewind. It's not making sense, right? <laughs> okay, you glossed over some stuff there because people want to know when you are, um, and I, I'm interested in you, when you're down, what are you doing? What are you doing? Because it's not so pretty sometimes Yeah. when you're, when you're at that spot. And in what are some of the core fundamental things that you would have done, Patty? And I'm sure at times you've gone through it even when you went, we went, went, went through the pandemic. What were some of the things that you were just doing for yourself I know you shared some of it with me when we were, um, you know, on your podcast, but what, what, what did you do or what do you continue to do as some staples for yeah. taking the steps? Absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's been an ongoing learning process for me because, you know, this is, this is a different journey, but one of, one of the first things I learned to do was to say no without, um, without feeling bad about it. You know, I was very involved in the community. I sat on, you know, a couple of, I was on a board, couple of board of directors. I was involved in different organizations and stuff like that. And, you know, as the journey progressed, you know, there was only so much of me to go around. And I knew that I couldn't, or I came to the revelation <laughs> that I couldn't do it all right. And, you know, so I had to start to pick and choose what my real priorities were with me at that time. Mm -hmm. And I want to emphasize at that time, because that doesn't mean that, you know, so I came off the boards, so I disengaged from some of the community things that I was involved in. Um, for, for my own self preservation, I knew that, or I was discovering how much more I was going to have to pour into me than I was used to pouring into other people. So that was a huge mind shift. We talked, you talked about, you alluded to this earlier about how we just, we give and we give and we do and we do. But I knew that in order to not go down with the ship, which was one of my goals and one of my anchors, which I kept coming back to, that I was going to have to start pouring into me a whole lot more guilt-free. And that's what I want to really emphasize is being able to do that guilt free. We cannot give what we do not have. You know, we've all heard you can't give from an empty cup. And I just really started to focus on what do I need to do for me to continuously fill my cup. And I actually even at one point got to the point where I was thinking, what if I could fill my cup so full that there was overflow and I could give from the overflow? And that was honestly such a mind shift for me. I haven't really mastered that yet. There's been a <laughs> lot going on, but it's something that I continue to think about. Like, what if we could fill our cup so full that it was overflowing and we could give from the overflow? We would never be giving from depletion. I just think that, it's, that's such, you know, it's, it's so amazing that you say that because uh, my son, I remember you know, these, these pivotal little moments, right. When you're thinking I I'm, I like you, I'm quite resilient. And so I launched my book six years ago and at my launch, my son spoke. And at that time, goodness, he was 14. And uh, the night before he's trying to read the, the acknowledgements and his voice is shaking. And I'm like, sweetheart, you can do it. You can do it. And then he got up on the podium. He was lovely. He read the acknowledgements and he was, you know, he sat up there with me and then on the way home in the car, he said to me, mom, mommy, I want to let you know, this was the best night of my life. Wow. And I was like, okay, did grandma tell you to do that? Did grandma, grandpa, who, who directed you? He goes, mom, this is all me. Right. Because, but again, like when you say people look at you, right. And to see, and ready for him, he was my main, um, you know, one of my main anchors to, yeah. to get through this time. And when he said that, I said, 
I don't care if this book ever does anything or if I do much with it, that, that made the moment for me because I was trying to teach other women that we all replicate things that are sometimes not functional for you, but this is the path through it. As a psychotherapist, I, I analyze my own book myself. Right. And uh, when RJ said that to me, I was just, that was it for me. I was, you know, um, overwhelmed with emotion that mm -hmm. I had impacted one of the most, uh, the most important people in my life. It all so yeah. worth it, um, you know, with a, a lots of hard work and all those things, you know, and um such a beautiful thing, right? Yeah. Such a beautiful thing. And, and the reality is we don't really know who all is watching our journey. Um, you know, I've been very transparent um, through my personal page on Facebook about my, I call it my AZ journey. And, you know, after the amount of time that I've been posting periodically about that, the people that and I am not doing it to get any accolades. I'm doing it to raise awareness of the situation and what the reality of the situation really looks like. Um, but the impact, the ripple effect is, is happening, right? And we, when we choose to walk our journey the best that we can possibly walk it, it will have that it's well, good or good, bad or ugly. It's going to have a ripple effect. So when we choose to walk it as best we possibly can, we can have the kind of impact that we really want to have. And that kind of leads me into something else that kind of popped into my mind that I'd like to share just briefly is about comparison because comparison is something else that I really had to work on not getting caught up in because I'm finding myself in a situation where I'm, you know, doing less and less with my work through this journey. And my, my friends and colleagues are like, you know, rising, professional women rising, they're doing the rising piece. And I was having to do the step back and, you know, not do some of the achievements that I was looking forward to and, and, and make some of those difficult choices. But when I, you know, part of the mindset that I had to really work on, and I'm in the midst of doing my neuro coaching certification so that I can just bring my clients to a whole number, another level with their transformation and my own personal transformation, you know, but what I came to realize was, you know, I'm running my own race. I'm walking my own journey. I'm desiring and choosing to be authentically me. And I want to be the best me that I can possibly be. And that doesn't mean looking at somebody else and, and, and wishing I could be doing that, but looking at somebody else and cheering them on and being authentically happy and supportive for what they're achieving. I think there's so much, you know, like bullying and all that kind of stuff out there that if we can really focus on walking our own journey and being the best that we can possibly be, then there's so much room to really be that cheerleader, be that encourager, you know, genuinely be happy for other people when they reach successes or, you know, whatever they're doing and whatever. In, in whatever way. But I, I think as let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, culturalization of women and, you know, we're the nurturers, you know, developmentally, we're supposed to go through certain things. And, you know, and then you get to the point and then a lot of the women, and again, my stage and change was around 44. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you've, you've done the schooling, you've, you've met the husband, you know, you've got the home, you've got the career, you got the child or children. And then it's like, okay, now what? Absolutely. Right. So if your if your values aren't in alignment, which is what happened with me at that stage, and I I kept I kept compartmentalizing. I kept thinking, you know, this, you know, I, this all these parts of my life were good, and then there was one that wasn't. Eh, so I'd shove it away. I'd mm -hmm. shove it away until there was no there was no negotiating. It was like, hello world, here you go. <laughs> hello Roxanne, are you there? And then <laughs> yeah. I had to wake up and and live it, and. But a lot of little girls, and not, not that little boys don't learn it as much, but they, we know there's such a difference in, in the way we um, acculturate children. A lot of women forego 
the things that you're talking about, which is listening to what they really need to do because of their roles. And, you know, what have you, have you, what have you found with some of the women that you've been coaching? And does that make sense that a lot of them sometimes maybe potentially put some of the things that they need on the back burner? So much. That makes so much sense, Roxanne. And that's exactly a great segue into that's where, that's where my summit came from. Like, you know, there's what I'm seeing in my coaching practice is there's so many women that, you know, they, they have all the exterior, they've achieved all the stuff, they've achieved all the exterior stuff, but there's this inner knowing there's this inner nudge that's, you know, maybe not constantly, but it's popping up periodically going like, is this it? Have I arrived? Is this all there is? Like, what I have is great but I'm not feeling fulfilled personally. I don't right. feel like at my core essence, I'm living authentically me and my life. And, and that's, you know, that's exactly where the idea for this summit came from, you know, a masterclass series to go from, I know there's more to life to living fully and boldly. So, you know, my, my whole goal with the, with the summit, and I invite each and every one of you, this is a free summit, and there is 21 incredible, amazing international speakers that are pouring their heart and soul into you about how to, how they've maneuvered through this, sharing their story and their tips and whatever, and, and how to do this. So it's, I'm so excited about it. Um, but, the, but that's where it came from, because you know, I, I was at that point and I see that a lot in my clients that they have all the exterior successes or, you know, have, have had multiple achievements, but there's still that inner, there's something that's going like, there's got to be more, there's got to be more, there's still something missing because they've given so many of those pieces of themselves away to others. Mm -hmm. And they haven't poured into even maybe even figuring out like, what are my core values? What are my core needs? Like what really matters to me? And that's something that I work on a lot with my clients is, you know, discovering what that is and, you know, creating the life that they really want built around those. Because when we create the life built around what really matters to us, what our values are, what our needs are, and the things that, in, you know, we know in our hearts, what really matters to us if we spend the time really digging into that. And if we can live our life from that place, not striving from it or for it, but living from that place, then it doesn't really matter so much about all the other accolades or all the other achievements because we're living from that fulfillment, which is, you know, I believe one of the reasons that we're here on this earth is, is to live the best life possible that we can and, and grow into the best version of ourselves that we possibly can so that we can be the person to give our best and I think know? it's almost like a metamorphic shift that all of us go through and but sometimes with women maybe men do it in a different way because they don't have some of the constraints but it's almost like you get to this this calling that says mm, you know, I mean, whether it's a shift in at home or it's a shift at work or it's a shift in community. And that's, you know, I don't think everybody's going to go off and maybe potentially, um, you know, change everything about their life. But sometimes it's the internal tweakings because you're getting the beckoning throughout. You know, it's like, you know, I don't know about over here or what about this or, you know, th those cues are constantly around you. And the same with me when I coach people, it's like, you know, how are you, you know, if you could listen to that deep down voice, yeah. what would that voice say back to you? Yes. Right. And I think that's sounds like that's what the summit is going to share all these fantastic uh, stories and all these amazing women. And I look, uh, I look forward to uh, being able to, to hear um, all the things that uh, these amazing speakers will share. So Patty, mm -hmm. for anyone that is wanting to connect with you, learn more about you. We will be putting the uh, link for, for the summit in, in the podcast notes is where can people reach you and any last words before I let you go? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm in the midst of doing a transition between two websites. So what I'm going to share is, is my email. If there's something that's connecting with you that resonates with you and you would like to just reach out and, and have a chat or connect in, in some way, 
my email is patty, P-A-T-T-I at kinergyleadership.com. And that's K-I-N-E-R-G-Y leadership.com. That um, website is still up and it'll give you some insight to me, but you know, there's a whole shift going on in my life. So I'm, I'm in the midst of some transition with that. But some final words, um, you know, like I just really encourage you, like we, again, I feel we've had a real opportunity in the last year in the pandemic to slow down. And the final words that I kind of want to lead every, leave everybody with is, is to, to honor that slow down and intentionally slow down so that we can speed up. Because until we get slow and quiet, and just be and, and have that time with ourselves to really get to know ourselves and start to dig into what really does matter to me. You know, like what, what difference do I really want to make in this world? And it doesn't have to be big and mammoth and thousands of people, you know, it can be like, I want to be the best mom that I possibly can be or whatever that is for you. It all matters. You matter and it all matters. So you know, taking that time to, to slow down, to really dig into, to what matters to you and, and think about like, I mean, just get your dreaming hat on, like throw all the inhibitions away. And if I could really dream about the life that I want to live, mm -hmm. what would that really look like? And, and don't worry about the hows at this point in time, just focus on what would that look like? What would it feel like? What would it look like? What would I hear? What would I smell? What would I taste? Like use all your senses to really get in that. I love to use the analogy of you have to pull an arrow back to be able to let it go to the bullseye. So that's kind of what I'm talking about here. Taking that time for yourself, that little step back to really dig into what matters to you so that you can really design the life that you want to live and work through starting to make that happen for you. Patty, thanks so much for your time. I'm sure everyone listening has gained so much today. And please sign in and uh, sign up for this, the summit. You, I am one of the speakers and uh, with a, a, you know additional 19, 20 other amazing women. Um, and for anyone that's wanting to know more about authentic relationships, either at home or at work, you can reach me at RoxanneDurhodge.com. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit RoxanneDurhodge.com slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.